Well, that was beautiful. Speaking about beautiful, <laughs> if you uh, notice when you came in, uh, our yard needs a bit of a cleanup from the fall. And the snow is now gone and ice, and so we are planning on having a yard cleanup day next Saturday, this coming Saturday from 9 in the morning till noon. And we would ask you to come. Uh, our walk of lights was a great thing in the fall, but it left a lot of remnant that we need to clean up for the summer. And so we need a lot of raking, just some of that saw uh, shavings, uh, saw wood. What am I trying to say? Uh, wood chips, yes. Anyway, they need to be cleaned up. And there's, a, there's tidy things. So men and women, if you are able to come, and just give some time this coming Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. There is a sign-up sheet. We'd ask you to sign up so we sort of know who's coming and we'll try to get it organized and what everyone can put their hand to. So that's this coming Saturday. Do sign up at the back uh, as you leave this morning. All right, the message I would like to share this morning is called... Seeing the big picture, seeing the big picture. These message thoughts came to me as a result of an experience I had a few weeks ago. I had spent a few days just seeking the Lord uh, for direction for the future and what the Lord wanted and, and uh, just sort of spending all this time. And I, I woke up this particular morning with an overwhelming sense, such, such a powerful sense, uh, and because I had been praying all along for this, and, and I felt the Lord just say, look at the big picture. Look at the big picture. And in my particular case, as I just sort of stepped back and looked at the big picture, it became obvious the Lord spoke to me what my de decision should be in the moment. And so from that, I started thinking about that, and different thoughts came to me. And I want to share some of those things with you this morning. Seeing the big picture. Well, what is seeing the big picture? That's seeing it from the beginning to the end. You're not just looking at this little bit. You're seeing the whole thing. Our problem is it's hard for us to see the big picture because we live in time. And we live moment by moment. And from our experience, it's chronological. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what's happening a month out or a year out. All the details of it. So how can I see the big picture? Well, there's only one way we can see the big picture, and that is to ask the Lord to show it to us. And it says in Revelation 12, in verse 13, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. As most of you know, Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. And he said, I'm the first, I'm the last. And the Lord sees everything from the beginning. He sees the big picture. He has a big perspective He's not caught by surprise by anything. He's not, he doesn't get discouraged because something happened because he knows. Now, it's not that he's predetermined at all. It's just that he knows in his foreknowledge. So he sees the big picture. And so we need to ask the Lord to help us to see the big picture in eternity, the big picture of our lives, because God sees you from the beginning to the end, from your natural birth to your death, from your spiritual birth to accomplishing the mission God has given you. He sees the big picture. There's a fill-in sheet uh, that you could get when you come in. If anyone would like one, the ushers are at the back. Just put your hand up, and they'll give you a sheet if you'd like to fill in as we go. Here's the first fill-in. God informs us of the end, but not the steps in between. So many times God will show us what the end is. He'll give you a vision of the end, but he doesn't always show you how you're going to get there. This was Abraham's experience. It said Abraham was uh, in Hebrews 11.8. Let me read it. Hebrews 11.8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Abraham lived in the Ur of the Chaldees, 
and he felt the Lord speak to him the theme of our year, step out and step up. Step out of your family, step out of your surroundings. I'm taking you to a new area. I have a new, I have an inheritance for you. I have a promised land for you. I'm taking you to a new country. And so I want you to step out and step up into that. And it said that Abraham obeyed. He wanted that destiny. He wanted the calling that God had given him in his life. So he stepped out. But this portion in Hebrews says, he had to step out by faith and that he stepped out to the place. He knew he was going to a country. He knew there was an inheritance for him, but he didn't really know where he was going. He didn't know the steps in between, but he stepped out anyway. And so many times God does the same for us. He will, he will point us in a direction. You have something in your heart. And, and even sometimes it's vague, but you know it's there. So he calls you to it. And you need to take action. And you step out. But you're not necessarily knowing where the next step's going to take you. But here's the beautiful thing with the Lord. He leads us step by step. And I believe that he always shows you the next step. He may not show you the step five ahead, but he will show you the next step. And if you'll walk by faith, listen, you will never go wrong if you walk in integrity. Because the integrity of the upright will guide them. If you have a sincere desire to follow the Lord, you want his purposes in your life. You're feeling he's calling you to something. And you step out into it. I believe when you do that in faith and you do it in sincerity, you'll never go wrong. Because he'll either show you very quickly that wasn't the step, or he will confirm it as you go. And so this is an important aspect of stepping out and stepping up. He doesn't always show you the full journey. But he tells you and he gives you a vision of the end. Almost like when, well, we'll get to it maybe in one of these other points. I might as well just keep going here as we go. Here's your next feeling. Decisions made in the moment should be determined by the big picture. So the, de the, the, the steps you're going to take in this moment is in light of the big picture. Your spiritual journey, you have to see the end. Keep the end in mind. Here's what David said in Psalm 73, verse 2. And so I'll just read the first two verses to you first. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Okay. So here's David, a man after God's heart. I mean, he has seen many things happen. Now he says, you know, on my spiritual journey, I almost stumbled. My feet almost slipped. And he tells us why. He said, I looked around, and he said, I saw those that were boastful, prideful. And he said, I saw that they were prospering. He saw that they were getting along in life. They were being successful. They didn't seem to have the problems that he was having and the adversity he was facing. And he said, I almost slipped in my spiritual journey. I almost stumbled. I almost gave up on the Lord. I almost said, what's the use? And a lot of other kings in Israel did this. They went after other gods and they forsook the God of Israel. He said, my feet almost slipped when I saw and compared myself to others. Now, this should be an indication to us. Because at any moment in time, wherever you are, if you just stop and freeze that moment and you look around at other people around you, you're going to see people that don't seem to be following God. And they're getting ahead. They're not going through the troubles you're going through. They seem to be prospering. They seem to be successful. They seem to be getting a lot of acclamation. And you're going through this hard time. You need that, that moment to stop and say, okay, I need to be sure of my footing here. 
because I could slip in this moment. And now if we go down to the bottom of the next verse, it's actually verse 17. He says, he, he, in these intervening verses from 3 to verse 17, he lays out in this psalm all the things that troubled him. How the, the people that weren't serving God seemed to be having a better life than he was. And then he gets down to verse 17 and he says, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. It was only when he stepped back and saw the big picture and said, in this moment, if I try to assess it right here, I might get the wrong impression. I might think they're doing okay. I might think they're better off than I am. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, until I went into the presence of God, in our setting today until I come to church, until I come to his word, till I begin to understand something. I understand a bigger picture. And when I step back and I understand their end and I realize there's going to be a judgment, I realize that everyone's going to stand before God. I understand that there's more to this life than what we see. There's a spiritual realm. There's a life after death. And when I step back and I saw their end, he said, I understood. And so all of these things spoke to me as I was thinking on this matter of seeing the big picture. On a practical side, my mind went to an experience I had a number of years ago. One of my mentors was uh, J.O. Moore. He was president of the Bible school when I first attended there. He was uh, superintendent of the denomination I was in in that time, and he, he was a great man, and I learned a lot of things from him. And one time, Kay and I were, were going to visit him in Toronto. He, he lived in a, an apartment building uh, off of the 401. And one time, I, we had been traveling down there with someone, and they said to me, we always call him Brother Moore, Brother Moore lives in that building. And it was a tall apartment building that you could see about a quarter of, the, of a mile, half a mile off of the 401. And I never forgot that. I, it happened to be three together. Three, it was sort of distinctive in those days. Three tall apartment buildings. He said, it's the one on the right. That's the one he lives in. So this one time, we were going down to visit him. And this was before the days of GPS. And so we were going down. And I said to Kay, I know where he lives. But I didn't know the roads how to get there. And I said, but we'll find it because I know where he is. And so sure enough, we're going down and I see the three apartment buildings and I see this apartment standing up. And so I pulled off at the next exit. Now I come to the end and I don't know which way to go. But I look up and I see the tall apartment building. So I turned in that direction. And I went down until suddenly it seemed like the apartment, and I said, we need to turn left. So I turned left. I didn't know what roads to turn, but it wasn't long before we pulled into the driving parking lot of the apartment building. And the only way I navigated all those turns, because I kept my eye on the goal, and it was tall enough and high enough, I just kept my eyes there, and every turn I made was in relationship to where I was going. Now, that is a spiritual analogy for us. You need to know the end. You need to see what God's purpose and plan is for you, and you need to step out into it. You know, some of you, years ago, I read the book by Stephen Covey, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It's, uh, it's been around for a long time. And I remember reading it, and I still remembered it uh, as I was thinking about these things. His second law was that begin with the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind. And so this truth not only, not only is in spiritual things, it's in everything. It's in for you to be effective. He said one of the, the main things you need to realize is begin with the end in mind. Envision what your future is, and work and plan towards it, and understand how decisions are to be made. They shouldn't be just hit and miss. It, can't, it shouldn't just be, I'm looking here, because you get in the weeds. 
and you can't see. Well, I don't know what I should do right here in this moment. And then you get pulled by your emotions. And you get pulled by what other people say to you. And, 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 and sometimes you just get utterly confused. You get lost in the weeds. And you just need to step back and look up and say, where am I going? What's the calling on my life? What does God want for me in my life? And so when you look at the end, then you begin to realize, okay, this is how I'm to change and move. God did this with many, many people. And then the way the Lord did it many times was giving them a new name. They were living in a certain reality, and he wanted to tell them their destination. So he changed the name of Abram to Abraham. He, na- he changed the name of his wife from Sarai to Sarah. And if you look up the meaning of Abram, it means high father. But if you look up the mean- meaning of Abraham, it's father of a multitude. Sarah means prince, or Sarai means princess. Sarah means mother of nations. And so God wanted to lift their vision. He wanted to say, you're more. Now, they don't have any children at this point. And yet God is changing their names to saying that you're going to be the father of multitudes and you're going to be the mother of nations. Now, we look back now and we see that's exactly true. All those nations in the Middle East, they came from Abraham and from Sarah. Whether it's Arab nations or Israel, it all came out of their loins. It was a calling that God had given them. And, and so he changed their name. He changes Jacob's name to Israel. From deceiver to one who is a prince with God. And, and again, I don't have time to go into all these stories. But Jacob was trying to do things on his own. Making decisions moment by moment. How he would overcome and get ahead. And it was all falling apart, and he had to flee from his home, and Esau is running after him. And so everything he's doing in himself is not working out until God stops him. He wrestles, and the Lord touches him and changes his name and says, really, what you need is power with God, not your own conniving and your own thinking on this. Go on and on. We see where God changes the names of people. Now, when Saul of Tarsus was called of God and the voice speaks out of heaven and uh, he's blinded, he goes into the city and Ananias comes to him. And what does Ananias say to him? I mean, this is a, a new Christian. He's just, just being saved. In fact, Ananias baptizes him and lays hands on him that he would receive the Holy Spirit. And then Ananias says to him, you are called and you are going to be uh, a witness to the Gentiles, and you're going to give witness between before kings. Well, when did that happen? Well, the Gentile aspect happened as he began his ministry. But it was only at the end of his ministry that he stood before King Agrippa and Festus and eventually taken to Rome to stand before the Caesar. I mean, but it was spoken to him right at the beginning. It's like God said, this is where I'm taking you. And so Paul had to... Keep his eyes on that regardless of what he was going through in the moment. What is the plan and purpose for your life? Some of you haven't determined that yet. But God has a plan and purpose for you. And part of the job of pastors in a local church is to equip the people for the work of ministry. And we're starting a 101 class next week or whenever it is, 27th of May, it's not next week, but it's a few weeks off. And through this 101, 201, 301, 401, it's a pathway that will take you to, to mission. And when you finish class 401, you come in for an interview, and we write a personal mission statement for you. We, we work with you to say, what's your shape? What's your, what's your spiritual gift? What's your heart's passion? What abilities do you have? What's your personality, your disposition like? What are your experiences? And taking these five aspects of shape, S-H-A-P-E, we try to determine, okay, well, how did God make you? And what are you for? How are you designed? And to write that out in a mission statement, that helps you to have a big picture. 
to see a big picture. Not just in the moment, oh, what should I do? Should I take that class? Should I go in that job? Should I get, in, you know, all these opportunities are ahead of me, but I don't know. But if you step back and say, how did God make me? Then it rules out some things, and other things become obvious. Just as I was trying to get to that Brother Moore's apartment building. The, the, the decisions you make along the way is determined by the end. And what's God? Now, we don't always see clearly, even as Abraham. He didn't know exactly, but he knew God had called him to something, and he, was he wasn't afraid to step out and take a risk. So here's your next fill-in. Seeing the big picture creates inspiration. It creates inspiration. And I, I found this verse in Isaiah. I hadn't been familiar with it, but I was just sort of going through on inspiration. And one of the translations... Uh, it, it, had the, it had inspired it. So let, it, let me just read Isaiah 41, 7 to you. So the craftsman encouraged the goldsmith. He who smooths with the hammer inspired him who strikes the anvil, saying, it is ready for the soldering. Then he fastened it with pegs that it might not totter. Now, when I looked into this a little bit, what was he talking about here? He's talking about this craftsman who wants to finish the product. And he encourages the person that's next to him, the goldsmith. The goldsmith is the one that's taking the, the object and covering it with gold. And he's inspiring the person that's hammering it smooth. Who has to hammer it smooth so the goldsmith can put the gold on it so it gets to the craftsman where he can finish it. And it says, though, that the, the one that's hammering it out, he, he looks to the one... That's hitting it with the anvil or on the anvil. And so as you realize the process of producing this, he's talking about here's a rough material that is put on the anvil and it's beaten with this huge hammer into a certain shape. And then it goes on to the one with the smaller hammers and he smooths it. And then it goes to the goldsmith who's going to cover it with gold. And then it goes to the craftsman who finally sets it in its place. Okay, each one's inspiring. In other words, the one that's doing, hitting it, the raw material with the anvil, he's doing it for a purpose. He's going to pass it on to the one that smooths it. The one who smooths it's going to pass it on to the goldsmith. And the goldsmith is going to pass it on to the craftsman. And it says each one is inspiring the other. Because you can't just see your part. You have to see your part in the big picture. Because you're doing a little part. But in the big picture, you are essential. And you need to be inspired. It says here they inspired them. When someone say, hey, you're, that's looking good. When you get it finished, I'm going to smooth it out. And then the one when he smooth it, says, hey, that's looking real good. Give it to me. I'm going to put the gold on it. And so forth along. It reminds me of the story of the three masons who were working side by side on a job site. And this man walking along sees the three masons in a row, and he says to the first man, what are you doing? And the first man says, I'm laying bricks. That's what he was doing. He was picking up a brick, putting the mortar on, putting it next. Picking up another brick, put the mortar on, and put, putting it in. So he said, I'm laying bricks. So he walks to the next man, and he says, what are you doing? And he says, because he's taken a step back. He said, I'm building a wall. Now he's not just laying bricks. He realizes, I'm, I'm building a wall. And then he goes to the third person and he says, what are you doing? And he says, I'm building a church where people are going to meet with God. Now, all of this... Uh, should speak to us. You're not just laying brick. You need to keep the end in mind. You need to see the big picture. And this speaks to so many ways in the local church, involvement in ministries, to realize that when you come next Saturday and we're cleaning up the yard, I'm not just raking wood chips. I'm beautifying a place where people are going to come and it's attractive and it's a place where they can come in and the people greeting at the door, giving a warm 
a handshake and a smile is making people feel comfortable so that when they come in and usher seat them and make them comfortable and giving things, they're feeling at home to the worship service that's preparing people to come into the presence of the Lord to the message I'm sharing. We all are doing a part because God wants to meet with us today. But if you only say, well, you can get discouraged. Ah, just laying bricks. I'm laying bricks every day. I don't like this. Let someone else lay some bricks. I've laid enough bricks. And we get that feeling many times in what we're doing in the church. Or, and it goes beyond church, just your work. Or your involvement in your neighborhood. And you can think, well, yeah, I just got that neighbor and bothering me. And, you know, and I don't like my job. And you need to take a step back. And look at the big picture. Has God placed me here? And I'm, what, what am I part of? What's the big thing that's happening that God wants to do right here? So we're naturally living in the moment. But we need to realize how my moment is relating to the big picture. And keep that in mind. Here's your next feeling. Seeing the big picture overcomes hardships. Hardships. Here's what Paul wrote. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul said, I've been through some sufferings. And if you go to 1 Corinthians, he actually lays it out. And I was just reading it actually this morning. He said, I was, I've been shipwrecked five times. I have been beaten with rods three times. He said... I have been shipwrecked three times. I have been in the open water for a day and a night. In other words, 24 hours he was in the open sea, hanging on to stuff. All these suffering things. You'd, you'd think that Paul would say, God, where are you? I'm trying to do your will here. I'm serving you. Why is the ship can't get to where it's going? Why don't you protect me from receiving these 40 stripes five times I've had it? Not what, Lord, you don't think once or twice, but five times? He says he was in prison. He said perils. See, there's a lot that Paul went through that's not recorded in the Bible, apparently. It doesn't record in the Bible other than his words, I've been shipwrecked three times. But he says in this verse... I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. He steps back from it and he says, okay, this is in the moment here, but you know what? I'm preaching the gospel. I'm seeing people saved. I'm going spreading this to where God has called me to go. I have been called to go to the Gentiles. And he was going from city to city to city to city of the Gentiles sharing the good news of Jesus. When he saw the big picture, he could endure the pain of the moment. It's like putting a jigsaw puzzle together. Sometimes you have a piece in your hand, and you look at it, and you say, I don't see any benefit in that piece. And you could be tempted to throw it away. <laughs> but if you throw it away and everything comes together, there's a piece missing. And no one likes a, a puzzle that you put together, and in the middle there's a piece missing. You look and scour the house for it because I want to find that piece. But in the moment, you don't see where it fits until you put it together. See, God has the big picture in mind. Now, I am terrible because I can't tell colors at putting jigsaw puzzles together. But I see Kay. She loves doing this, and she'll sit with the box and the picture. And she will pick up a piece and look at the box, and then she knows whereabouts it's going to go on the puzzle. So you have to step back. You've got to look at the big picture to see what's going on. Here's the next feeling. Seeing the big picture gives you perseverance. Perseverance. You've got to keep going and keep doing it. Olympic, Olympic athletes will go through their regiment for three years and their diet and their exercise every day and getting up early and... You know, you hear them interviewed after the Olympics of all the things they've gone through to get there. But why are they doing it? Because they have a goal in mind. They want the gold. 
They envision the gold. And so it allows them to endure and push forward. And you've heard me share this before from Hebrews 12 too. And it relates to our time that we had around the Lord's table. It says Hebrews 12 too. Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Why could Jesus go through the suffering and the mocking and the pain and the hurt and the humiliation and the shame of the cross? For the joy that was set before him. He saw the big picture. That's why he said, not my will, but thy will be done. See, are you giving up in the moment? Are you struggling in the moment? Or you're thrown off the path in the moment. What you have to do is step back a little bit and look at the big picture. It'll help you to persevere as you go forward. Here's the next feeling. The big picture will keep you on the right path. It'll keep you on the right path. You see, you're taking steps one by one forward. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by it. On your journey, there's always two pathways. There's the broad way and the narrow way. A lot of people are going the broad way. But it's not leading to life. It's leading to destruction. But narrow is the way that leads to life. Now, here, this is an important truth. If you follow the majority of people around you, you're going the wrong way. And yet, in the moment, we say, well, how come they can do that? Well, how come I got to do this? Look what I'm losing out. Look what I, I am contributing. No one else is. I'm going to be like everyone else. If you do that, if you succumb to that, you're going to go the wrong way. It's a narrow way to get to where God wants you to be. The purpose of your life. How he's designed you. And you got to be ready to say, I'm going to go on the road less traveled. I'm not just going to have the philosophy of the world. And I, I, I have to go with it because everyone thinks this. And so i got to think this. And I'm, I'm embarrassed to, to say I think differently. No, it's a narrow way. And you have to stand many times for things. And, and here's one thing I would just say. To keep on the right path, you have to follow godly values and principles. There are some things by just knowing, I don't do this. I don't lie. I don't cheat. I don't talk about other people. I don't take advantage of other people. I'm a giver. I'm not a taker. I'm not viewing everything in light of how does this benefit me. I want to benefit other people. Now, that's a narrow road. But if you set your heart and say, I'm going to walk that road. I'm not going to compromise. There are some things in God's word I'm aware of. And I'm tempted because everyone else is is compromising. Everyone else is doing it. But I'm not going to. I'm going to keep my feet on on this pathway. It will lead you to success. It will lead you to the fulfillment of God's purpose for your life. Man, that's a big one right there. So many people are tempted off of the narrow way because everyone else is doing it. This is a statement I I read uh, years ago and it came back to my mind and it speaks so true. A bend in the road is not the end of the road unless you fail to make the turn. A bend in the road is not the end of the road unless you fail to make the turn. And there's lots of turns in life, and a lot of things happen. And and you'll be tempted to not bend with it and not say, Lord, I yield my will. It's not my will. Your will be done. I'm going to bend with this. I'm going to turn with this. I don't know why we're turning left here, and I don't know why it looks like we're making a U-turn back, but I'm going to follow the path. You're guiding. You're leading. and And you turn it over to the Lord. And you stay on that narrow path. Here's the next one. The big picture will keep you from sinning. Hebrews 11, speaking about Moses, says, By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. 
esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked for the reward. It gives us an insight into Moses. He had all the privileges of being a prince in Egypt. And there was a lot of pleasures. But it's said that he rather chose to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy those pleasures. When you see the big picture, it will keep you on the right path. If you're just looking at the moment, the pleasure of the moment, oh, this would feel so good if I do this. Oh, I want to give in to this. And you, you give in to that temptation in the moment. How do you get past that? You need to step back for a moment and say, you know what? This is not going the right way. I know there's a momentary pleasure here, but if I yield to that, it's going to bring a negative effect in my life. And we all know it. And I, again, I was reminded of a verse that I'm familiar with in Proverbs, which speaks about when you try to get something by deceit and dishonesty. It says it starts like sweet bread in your mouth, and then it turns to gravel. And I've experienced, have you experienced that with sin? Here's a sin. It smells so good. It, 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 it's like beautiful bread coming out of the oven. And it, it's so tasty. I want to taste it. It'd be so good. It'd be so sweet. And you bite into it. And that first bite is so good. And then you start chewing it. And you get a little grit in your mouth. And you chew a little bit more. And, and now it's really sandy. And suddenly your mouth is full with gravel. See... When you are tempted by sin, you've got to step back and see the gravel aspect of this. If you're living right in the moment, you might be tempted to bite into that beautiful, sweet roll. But if you step back and say, okay, this is just Satan. This is chocolate-covered poison. And the chocolate's going to taste good, but it's going to poison my life. See, you've got to step back. It'll keep you from sinning. Let's go quickly. The big picture creates a positive mood. The big picture creates a positive mood. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Now, all these truths are pointing to the same thing. You can get down in the moment. You can be depressed looking at your present situation, your momentary situation. Uh, situation you're in and it can create a negative mood but it says count it joy you got to step back from it and say you know but God's got a bigger picture in this I put in your notes negative moods are created by focusing on present hurts and not seeing God's intended purpose now that someone needs us to take that home and memorize that because you're in a bad mood, you're in a bad mood towards your spouse, you're, you, you get negative towards your kids, you're negative to your workers at work because of the past and they've mistreated you and you're not getting what you should get and they always do this to me and it will never change and over and over. The devil points to all these things and you can get down and get negative, you can get negative about the church. You see all the things, and the devil loves to point out all those faults. And no church is perfect. Every church has, makes, and every church leader is imperfect. Amen. And if you look for him, you'll find it, and it'll sour your mood. But you've got to say, you know, but what, what's the big picture here? I had this picture of horses in the past, you know. Uh, they have blinders on them. Yeah. Now, why is that? Because a horse will get distracted by the things around it. And they'll put blinders on horses that are call, pulling carriages and so forth. So they don't get distracted. They don't get spooked by what happens. Amen. How many times have you got spooked by something? Amen. Someone has said something. There's been a blow up around you. You feel the results of the blow up. Maybe you've been part of that blow up. And so you, you get thinking negative and you, 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 you get down and you say, this is I, just like David, your feet almost slips. 
So you gotta, you got to stop and you got to say, I need to put something on me that keeps my eyes going forward and to see that what now, that God's got a purpose in this. And it says here, you know, that the trial you're going to do is producing patience in you. Paul prayed about a thorn he had, a thorn that Satan was poking him with. And he prayed three times it would go away. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. You need this because you, I've given you many, many revelations. And you could get proud and puffed up over the things I have given you. So I'm allowing this thorn in the flesh just to keep poking your ego, letting the air out of your ego. There's a purpose in it. I don't understand God's ways are not my ways. I don't know why God does everything the way he does. But I need to sit back, stand back and say, you know what? God has a purpose in this. And my life's first. And we know that God works all things together for good. To them that love him and are called according to his purpose. We, you need to know that. It's a big picture perspective. I'm looking at the big picture. Jesus said, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. A Christian who has their, pit, their eyes on the big picture need not be depressed. Your mood can be positive and confident if you keep your eyes on the Lord. Here's your last fill-in. The big picture helps you to serve others. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. You see, if you don't see the big picture, you will always see how you're being used by others. Well, why should I have to do that? Why don't I get any benefit out of this? This is not fair. All I'm asking is fairness. I just want it to be fair. I want to get as many benefits as the owner does. As the night person beside me. We don't want to be a servant. We don't want to just. But if you keep the big picture and say, you know what? The servant is actually the greatest in the kingdom of God. Then it allows you to keep going forward. Look at this verse, Mark 8, 35. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's sake will save it. You always have to see the big picture of the gospel in all your relationships. You can get upset by someone that does something towards you. Contractor who cheats you. The clerk that is rude. And you can react in the normal and go down the broad path. Or you can say, you know, maybe God's put this, in, this person in my life, and how can I serve them? How can I lay down my life for them? How can I turn the other cheek? How can I do good to this person? I'm telling you, folks, you have to see the big picture. If you're living in the moment, you'll be up and down, tossed to and fro like a cork on, a, on an ocean. You'll be thrown every way by every situation. We all have triggers. That if someone says a certain comment to you because of your past, it really sets you off. You need to realize that and disengage all those triggers. Say, you know what? Why is that triggering me? It'll be based in a short-sighted view. But if you can stand back and see the big picture, God's going to lead us to our destiny. Shall we stand together this morning? Oh, Lord, I need this message. <laughs> you need this message. Turn to the person beside you and say, you need this message. <laughs> now, speak to the Lord as we're going to go to the Lord in prayer and say to the Lord, Lord, I need this message. my eyes opened I want to see the big picture oh Lord help us today
want to reach our destiny. We want to be what you want us to be. We want to be effective witnesses for you. It's your kingdom. It's all about your kingdom. It's not about us. It's all about you, Lord. It's all about how we are affecting other people around us. May our lives change as a result of hearing this today and letting these thoughts get into the fiber of our being. I pray this in Jesus' name this morning. Amen. 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 Well, go in the name of the Lord.